Anna, cradling her three-year-old son, walked down the street. The skinny boy was not very heavy, but the woman's arms hurt and her back went numb. However, the woman did not stop and walked carefully along the slippery sidewalk with a sleeping child in her arms. The snow immediately covered her footprints and dripped down in large drops as it touched her burning cheeks. Or maybe it was the tears of a poor woman who had been kicked out of the apartment with her child by her husband. Anna had been wandering around the city for hours, not knowing what she should do now. She had no money, and Jonathan had smashed her phone, throwing it on the floor in a rage and crushing it with his foot. It was all because he thought, for some reason, that Jeremy wasn't his son. The city was getting ready for the holidays. The scent of fresh pastries was everywhere. The music was playing and the lights on the Christmas trees were flashing. But she and Jeremy were alone, freezing in the snow-covered streets. Anna took a deep breath and suddenly realized she was falling. Her legs gave way. She fell right into the snowdrift. The woman wrapped her arms around her son and froze in that position, feeling the hot waves of fever spreading through her body. Jeremy tossed and cried. Anna whispered something to him, tried to get him up, but could not do that. Jeremy tossed and cried. Anna whispered something to him and tried to get up, but could not do that. Suddenly, someone put a hand on her shoulder. She slowly turned around and saw an old woman in a shabby coat and a gray scarf. Come on. Come on, dear. Get up. Let's go inside. You can't walk in the cold with a baby. Let me help you. There you go. Come on. Get up slowly. The old woman said as she helped the woman to stand up. To Anna's surprise, the old woman's hands turned out to be very strong and she managed to get to her feet with her help. Where are we going to? asked Anna. To my apartment. I live in this building on the first floor. I've been watching you through the window for ten minutes now. At first I thought you were drunk and just walking around. But then I saw you were holding a baby in your arms. Well, come on, let's go. It's really cold, said the old woman, gently supporting Anna. My name is Mrs. Forrester. What's yours? Anna, and this is my son Jeremy. What a good name. Jeremy, the old lady mouthed, leading the guests towards her place. So chattering, the old lady led Anna to the door of her apartment and swung it open. Come in, Anna. My apartment is not wealthy, but it's warm here. And the refrigerator is always full. I will prepare a hot bath so you can bathe Jeremy. And warm up in the hot water, too. Then we will have dinner and tea, and everything will be all right. Her grandmother encouraged her, said Anna, turning toward the woman. You saved Jeremy and me from death. It's so cold, we would have frozen to death by morning. It's all right, girl. God is merciful. He always helps, Mrs. Forrester answered calmly. Grandma, who's there? A man's voice came from the next room. We have guests, Kevin. Anna and Jeremy. We'll come in and say hello to you in a moment, replied Grandma. Anna felt embarrassed. She didn't expect anyone else to live here. She glanced at the front door, and the old lady understood her confusion. Don't worry, it's my grandson, Kevin. He's bedridden after an accident for over a year now. I take care of him. He has no parents. Sometimes a nurse visits us. Well, let's go say hello. Anna came in and saw a big guy in his thirties. He rose slightly on the cushions and looked at his guests and the little boy hiding behind her. Hello, said Anna. Hello, he replied and frowned. Kevin, I'll be right back. I'll only show Anna where she's going to sleep. Mrs. Forrester explained to him and walked out, showing Anna the way to her room. Half an hour later, Anna, with her skin red from the hot water, came out of the bathroom, sitting in a warm terry cloth robe and feeding Jeremy the soup Mrs. Forrester had heated up for them. The old lady already knew why Anna was outside late at night and only shook her head. Your Jonathan is just a fool, a fool and a heartless man. How is it even possible to kick a wife and child out in the winter? 
he took a DNA test, and according to the papers, Jeremy is not his son. But I know it can't be. Jeremy is his son. There's been some mistake. Anna excused herself. I just can't believe it. They believe the papers, but they don't believe the people? What happened to the world? What happened to people? My Kevin is such a good guy. He's only 27 years old and he's already bedridden. And you know why? He worked as a manager for a construction company. Some inspection committees came up to check on the construction site, but one of them climbed where it was forbidden and slipped and fell. Kevin managed to save him at the last moment, but he couldn't hold on and fell from a height right onto a pile of bricks and was hidden his back. That guy wasn't hurt, he was just scared. But Kevin had a serious fracture. When his fiance found out Kevin was bedridden for the rest of his life, she left him. Can you imagine? She was already living with him. Getting ready for the wedding, she pretended to be nice, pretended to love him, and then trouble happened, and she just left him right away, sighed the old woman, and suddenly realized, Oh, Anna, it's very late. It's time to go to bed. Jeremy's almost asleep. Don't look for me in the morning. I'll go to the market in the morning. Make yourself at home. Cook some breakfast. Drink tea. You can take anything you find in the fridge. In a burst of attitude, Anna hugged the kind old woman and tears came to their eyes. That night, Anna could not sleep for a long time. Jeremy slept peacefully beside her and she listened to his breathing and thought about her strange fate, which led her to kind strangers. Yesterday, there had been nothing that foretold trouble. Or it did, and she just didn't believe it. Anna was raised by her grandfather. She hardly remembered her mother, who died when she was only five years old, and she never knew her father. Her grandfather adopted the little girl and raised her until she was 17. They lived in a village, and all the housework fell on Anna's shoulders very early. But she never complained. She understood that her grandfather could not cope with everything without her help. When her grandfather passed away, the girl felt truly alone. And one day, a young handsome Jonathan came to their village. His relatives lived there and he came to visit them. Jonathan saw Anna when she was walking home after swimming in the river. He could not pass by such an attractive girl. Jonathan really liked the smiling Anna and began to visit her often. He was also impressed by the sternness of the young beauty. One day, he pulled Anna close to him by force. Then the easygoing and calm girl immediately turned into a wildcat. After that, Jonathan begged her forgiveness for two weeks, promising that it would never happen again. Jonathan wooed Anna for more than a year, falling more and more in love with her. And on her 19th birthday, he proposed to her. Anna said yes. Soon they were married and her husband took her to the city, promising her eternal love and endless happiness. But it didn't turn out that way. Jonathan's family was not wealthy, more like middle class, but they were hereditary scientists and paid special attention to the matters of bloodlines. They reacted sharply negatively to their son's marriage to the country girl. Jonathan, can you explain why you took that beggar girl to our apartment? She's dressed like she's still in her godforsaken village. She doesn't have a penny. How can you show her to people? How are you going to go out in public with that ugly girl? His mother said. Mom, Anna is a decent girl. She's kind and hardworking. Her son tried to change his mother's mind. Oh my goodness, what benefit can we get from her kindness? If you had married Melody like we wanted you to, I wouldn't say a word about your choice, but now. Mom, that's what you wanted, not me. Melody is stupid and frivolous. But she's rich. Are you going to play chess with her or what? And anyway, you dated her, and everything was fine until you met that ugly beggar. Jonathan, you don't understand. You can live in a big luxury house now, but all we have to live in is a two-bedroom apartment. What your sister going to do? She's getting married soon, too. And how will we all live here? His mother asked pretentiously. Rent an apartment, my sister advised. When you have a baby, I don't want to listen to the babies cry all the time. Anna often heard all these conversations. She asked her husband to go to the village and live there. But Jonathan didn't even want to hear about it and didn't want to rent a place to live. Taking out their anger on the girl, Jonathan's mother and sister turned her into a slave. And she, not wanting to ruin the fragile peace in the family, patiently 
did everything they told her. To everyone's surprise, Anna could not get pregnant quickly, and then her husband's mother and sister began to suspect the girl of infertility. And why did you come into our lives at all? You are of no use to us at all, her mother-in-law once exclaimed, looking at her daughter-in-law with hatred. You can't even clean the floors properly. Anna's patience ran out. At this very moment, she was cleaning the floor. She straightened up, threw the rag on the floor, and suddenly pushed the bucket with her foot. The bucket fell and water spilled all over the floor. That's it. I've had enough, she exclaimed, and, not listening to her mother-in-law's shouts, began to pack her stuff quickly. Jonathan turned away from the computer and went out to the noise. But Anna had already slammed the front door. Her husband caught up with her outside and started begging her to come back. No way. And you know what? Either you look for an apartment right now or I'm filing for a divorce, she told her husband confidently. Jonathan found a place to live within an hour. It was as if fate had been waiting for it. As soon as they moved out of his parents' house, Anna got pregnant and nine months later gave birth to a baby boy, Jeremy. The young mother was so busy with her son that she didn't notice that something strange was going on with her husband and that something had changed between them. She had no idea that his mother and sister were assuring Jonathan that the child didn't look like him at all. While we were living together, she couldn't get pregnant. As soon as you moved out, it happened right away. It's not your baby. He doesn't even look like you, the mother told her son. Believing them, Jonathan secretly took a DNA test, and three days before Christmas, he threw the papers in her face. Then he kicked her and their son out of the apartment. Anna sighed. Her only close relatives kicked her out, but some strangers sheltered her. The young woman closed her eyes and, listening to the breathing of her sleeping son, fell asleep. When she woke up in the morning, she looked around in surprise. At first, she did not even realize where she was. After remembering everything, the woman sighed again and realized Jeremy was not there. Anna quickly got up from the bed, walked across the apartment, and stopped on the threshold of Kevin's room. Jeremy was sitting next to the poor guy, telling him something. Jeremy, why are you disturbing Kevin? She exclaimed and immediately apologized for her son to the man. It's okay, he's funny, Kevin smiled. She noticed that he had a nice smile. But then he saw the sympathy for him in her eyes. He frowned again and said, All right, go feed your son. Anna saw him rise slightly on his elbows again, and she raised an eyebrow in surprise. Why aren't you getting up? she asked. You don't look like a completely immobile person. I think you have a good chance of getting back to a normal life. Listen, Kevin replied sharply. Don't you have anything better to do with your time? Leave me alone. Actually, where's Grandma? Why does she let you come in here in the first place? Anna left the room hurriedly, but she had already made up her mind and was confident that she would succeed. That same day, the young woman told Mrs. Forrester that she would help take care of Kevin. It's hard for you to take care of him, isn't it? He's a big guy. You can't even imagine, the old lady sighed. But how are you going to do it? Kevin will protest. We're not going to ask his opinion, Mrs. Forrester. He needs a little change of scenery. And now, let's get ready for the holiday together, the girl said with a smile. Happiness came into the house together with Anna. She knew how to cook the most delicious meals with the cheapest ingredients and took care of all the household chores. She also told Kevin that his grandmother had hired her to nurse him. You do understand how hard it is for an old lady to take care of you, she told him. No, you're the one who doesn't understand, Kevin insisted. Do you even know what it's like to take care of a bedridden person? You'll not only have to give me medicine and dress me... But you'll have to bathe me. Do you want me to burn with shame? No, I want you to get back on your feet, and I'm stubborn. And in the summer, we will go to my house in the village. Fresh air will make your recovery go even faster, the girl said with confidence. The long arguments ended in Anna's victory, and Mrs. Forrester, looking at her grandson, couldn't be happier. Now he was always shaved, looking cheerful, and always smiling. He also began to exercise bringing his muscles back to tone. Anna visited many doctors and finally got a referral for a recovery massage therapist for Kevin. The boy slowly but surely began to get better. 
in the summer, Anna took everyone to her country house. Only six months later, Kevin could already move around in a wheelchair. Back then, both Mrs. Forrester and Anna cried tears of happiness. She fell in love with Kevin a long time ago and believed that one day they would be together. And then something happened that neither Anna nor Kevin expected. Mrs. Forrester and Jeremy went to the river. Anna was giving Kevin a massage when he suddenly put his arms around her and kissed her. Kevin! she exclaimed, but she couldn't tear herself away from his lips. Anna, he whispered and squeezed her tighter and tighter in his arms. She couldn't help but reciprocate him. She was the woman, and he was the man. She was the one who made him a man again, who brought him back to normal life. Since then, Kevin's recovery went faster. He was extremely happy, and Anna didn't want any other fate anymore. But one day, a car stopped by their building. Jonathan got out of the car. When he saw his ex-wife, he got down on his knees in front of her and begged, I'm, I'm sorry, forgive me for everything. Come back to me. I can't live without you. I get drunk every day and I can't sleep. I see you in my dreams every night. Forgive me. What happened, Jonathan? Why have you decided to repent? Asked Anna. Melanie did it. She worked in the lab and faked the DNA test results. I only found out about it recently. I overheard her talking. We lived with her for two months. But now I kicked her out. Anna, I am so sorry. Come back to me. I beg you. The ex-husband continued. No, Jonathan, you were right. My son doesn't need a father like you. And I love another man. We're expecting a baby, so please get out of my life, the woman said calmly. Anna! She heard a happy man's voice. But it wasn't Jonathan. It was Kevin. Anna turned around and froze. He was standing on his own feet near the wheelchair. The woman gasped and rushed to him, hugging and kissing him. And Jonathan stood looking at them for a while. And then he got in the car. He was going to stop at the store to get a bottle of booze. Or maybe even two bottles, for he was in grief. In great grief.